But before we actually get into the presentation, let's review some of the fundamentals of theory of constraints. There are two things that Elliot Goldratt has introduced to us through his book, The Goal. The first is the five focusing steps. The first step is to identify your constraint. Every process has a constraint, and we need to focus on breaking that constraint. So we have to first identify it. Once we've identified it, we want to be able to exploit the constraint. By exploiting the constraint, we're saying that we want the constraint to do only what the constraint is equipped to do. We don't want it to have to do anything else that can be offloaded onto somebody or something else with inside of the system. The third step is to subordinate everything else to the constraint. Nothing else really matters except the productivity of the constraint. Trying to optimize the productivity of things that are not on the constraint actually will have a detrimental effect on the system. So we want to subordinate those things. We'll show how that has an impact on our software development process. The fourth thing is we want to elevate the constraint. If through the process of exploiting the constraint, offloading anything off of it that should be done elsewhere, and subordinating everything else around the constraint, if that has not yet been able to break the constraint, then you can elevate the constraint by doing things like buying more, providing training, providing better tools, whatever you need to do in order to be able to elevate the productivity of the constraint. It's interesting that steps two and three don't cost any money in order for you to be able to implement them. You can exploit your constraint and subordinate everything else around your constraint without spending any money. Once you have broken that constraint, a new constraint is going to sur surface with inside of the project. So step five is go back to step number one and do this over again. So what we have here is one project's agile wall. This is an agile wall for a specific project, for a specific client, in a specific domain. We're not saying that this is the agile wall that every wall should look like. Every wall is going to be unique. It's going to have unique requirements. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through a scenario for a project team that had a workflow that looked like this. For this specific team on this specific project, you'll note that the workflow involved a story card going from a business analyst to a developer, from a developer to a web developer, and from a web developer to QA. And once QA signed off on the story card, it went into a done state. This is the life cycle of the story card for the animation and the scenario that we're going to be talking about today. So let's take a look at some of the lean principles that will surface through the use of this agile wall. First of all, in lean, we want to release small batch sizes into the system. You see that we have a total of 88 story cards in our release backlog but we don't release all 88 into the system at once. We introduce small batch sizes. It's the number of story cards that are going to be played in an iteration. In this case, it's going to be 11 story cards that are going to be played. So that's our small batch size. We also want to keep our work in progress down. Our work in progress would be the total number of story cards that are actually in play on the Agile story card wall. What we've done is we've introduced a WIPO meter at the bottom to help us keep an eye on the total number of story cards that are actually in play on the story card wall. We want to keep the amount of story cards in play down as low as possible. We also want to keep our, our work cycles for each story card as short as possible. Once a story card has begun to be played, we want it to get done as quickly as possible. There's another aspect of theory of constraints called drum, buffer, and rope. The drum is the constraint that you have with inside your system. That drum sets the pace or the cadence for the work that's going to be doing in the system. The drum is always associated with the constraint in your system. The constraint is that part of your system that has the least amount of capacity. So in this case, you see that QA has the capacity for doing 10 story cards per iteration, whereas the other roles on the project have greater capacity. Therefore, in this case, the drum is going to be QA, and QA is our constraint. The buffer is what we use to protect the drum from being starved for work. Because our constraint is the thing that constrains our overall capacity for delivering work being done, we want to make sure that it always stays busy. That is what we want to focus on for 100% utilization. We never want it to starve. 
Now there's going to be fluctuations with inside the system. So we want to make sure that there's always a small buffer of work available for QA so they're never sitting around idly waiting for work. We do that by introducing a little bit more work into the system than what QA in this case can handle. And that little bit more work is what we refer to as the buffer. The third aspect of drum buffer and rope is the rope. And the rope is what ties our constraint, which is QA, with the release of work into the system. So because our capacity or our constraint is 10 story cards, we tie that to the amount of work that's being released into the system, which in fact is 11. Now tying this rope from our constraint to what releases work into the system allows us to not have to worry about the capacity of the BAs, the developers, and the web devs. We don't have to manage that. All we have to do is manage the constraint and manage the amount of work that comes into the system. There's a couple other things that we need to point out in this specific Agile wall chart. For example, our velocity is 11 story cards. And we're just going to go with the assumption that every story card is approximately the same size. So our velocity is based on story cards, not story points. What we've done is we've introduced nine iterations into this animation that we're going to be showing in a few minutes. It should take us nine iterations in order for us to be able to get this done. We note that we have 88 story cards total. And if our velocity is 11, we should be able to get things done in 8 iterations. But because our capacity is 10, it's going to take a little bit more than 8 iterations to get done. So we've thrown in a ninth iteration as a contingency plan. Also note that the capacities that we have here are based on historical evidence. These are not things that we determined ahead of time. These are things that we adjusted to or adapted to as we saw how the team was functioning. So the team kind of leveled itself off after several iterations of having this kind of capacity. So what we're going to do is we're going to run an animated story card wall. And that animated story card wall is going to go through a specific scenario that shows how we can apply principles of lean and theory of constraints. And when we're done with that animated story card wall, we're going to run a few what-if scenarios. That animation that we're going to look at has got a specific problem that gets introduced into the system which has a detrimental effect on the system as a whole. And what we want to do is evaluate a few other what-if scenarios of applying theory of constraints and lean to the process to see if we can optimize the system better than what we currently have here.